Hi. So I'm doing a series, uh, a series on performers that have been highly influential on my life. I did one on Harry Blackstone. Uh, he's he's continues to be a hero of mine, even though I never saw his live performance. I never saw Harry Blackstone Jr. either. But as I mentioned, uh, my father told me the stories about these guys growing up, and and those stories that my father relayed to me were highly influential. Well, this gentleman right here. George Goebel. George Goebel was a personal friend of mine, but he became a friend over a period of time. <coughs> he's, uh, he's one of Baltimore's great magicians. Baltimore has a tremendous heritage of performers and of history when it comes to the magical arts. And I was privileged, and I mean privileged, to come to know this man. Uh, as, as I mentioned when I talked about Blackstone, my dad, my dad was never a performer. My grandfather uh, was a performer, but he did it more to entertain his family and friends than as a, as a calling or as a profession. I'm the one who, who took up the mantle as, as a professional, as a more professional at least than other members of my family, but I come from a long heritage as well. But my dad, my dad was a, was a Magic fan, and at one time, I was in the Cub Scouts and then the Boy Scouts, and I did that whole thing. And my dad became the pack master uh, of my Cub Scout group. Now I was eight years old, and I wore the little blue uniform and uh, the Cub hat and the whole bit. And as a pack master, my dad had some influence as to as to uh, what we were going to do as, a, as an organization. And he brought in a number of magicians. I remember he brought in a, a coin worker, which was a bad idea for a blue and gold dinner, let me tell you, because you have families, you have kids, you have a theatrical setting, and for somebody to be making a coin vanish from this hand and reappear in this hand is, is a very challenging thing to pull off in a theatrical setting like that. So it wasn't a good idea. But he had George. He had George come and perform at the Cub Scout group. Now I'm, I'm eight years old. <clears throat> I'm really seeing uh, my first live magic show. I can't, I can't remember if I, saw, <clears throat> if I saw a show before George. So he was probably the first live magician I ever saw. So he comes to the, he comes to the, the Cub Scout group. And this isn't a blue and gold, this is a pack meeting, meaning that you have, again, you have families and you have, uh, you have uh, children, but you don't have as, as elaborate a setting as you would, say, a blue and gold. So George shows up, I think it's a, it's a weeknight, and, uh, and he, he does his show, and, and a couple of things stand out in my mind. Now, my dad's the pack leader, right? So, so George does a, a, a cut and restored this bit is so funny because uh, my dad's standing up there and, and George asks him to examine this rope. So my dad uh, drapes the rope around his neck. So he has the rope now hanging down here like this. Uh, George picks it up to cut it, but uh, accidentally uh, he cuts not only through the rope, but my dad's tie as well. So here's my dad standing up in front of everyone. He's got this, this cut off tie here. So George is embarrassed. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I, I'm so sorry. Here, here, rip, take the tie off. Let me see what I can do. So my dad takes the little stub of the tie off, and George restores the tie, as well as the rope. So it's, it's a great little bit. Uh, in that particular show, George also did the vanishing bowl of water, which I think was pretty ambitious for that environment. Uh, he fills a bowl with water, and he, he puts a drape over it. He picks it up and throws it up into the air, and it vanishes. Uh, fantastic uh, effect. He also did the hippity hop rabbit. So, a lot of magicians will say that, and in fact, Denny Haney used to say, "Don't do sucker effects because, because it it, it can alienate alienate an audience, and it can. Okay, a sucker effect can have that impact on an audience. They they feel uh, they feel like they've been had, and, and they don't like it." Um, but in some ways, it depends on how you present it. And as in all things, it comes down to presentation. And the way George presented it was was not antagonistic at all. It was just just plain funny. 
and uh, and I remember being um, going along with that and <coughs> thinking, oh, oh, he's turning them around, he's turning them around, turn around. So I, I'm part of the audience now, uh, screaming for George to turn around. And so, uh, if you if you're not familiar with the effect, you have you have a, a a black bunny and a white bunny, and they're covered, and the black one's over here and the white one's over here. That's why they call them the hippie hop rabbits. Of course, when when you, you turn the things around when they're covered and say, oh, you, you, they're they're the same color on both sides, and so the kids think, well, you know, you're you're just turning it around. So when when the covers are off, the kids are screaming, turn them around. So when George finally turns these around, there's one that's yellow and there's one that's red, and it's it's precious. I, I still like the effect. It's precious. Uh, it was hysterical. Everybody laughed. Everybody had a good time. George laughed. Uh, another thing that he did with my dad at the uh, when he was he was done doing the, the cut and restore tie and my dad was putting his tie back on he went to sit down and George pulled the shirt out from un, under him so so now he has no shirt uh, that was precious too but <clears throat> another thing that George did that uh, at that particular show that raises a few eyebrows was he did the uh, the razor blade trick. Now if you're not familiar with the razor blade trick, here's the way this works. You have uh, five uh, five to eight uh, razor blades. You show them sharp, so so George is up there, he's, he's cutting a piece of paper with razor blades. And then he places each one on his tongue and swallows it down. Oh my goodness! And I, I, think, I think he had the right audience, I really do. Um, we, we were on the edge of our seats. I, I got to tell you, I'm sitting on the floor, okay? A, a, a couple of rows back, I'm sitting on the floor with my buds, and we are just, we're just, oh my goodness, he's swallowing razor blades. We are on the edge of our seats. We're on the edge of our seats with danger, risk. Uh, there was no chance that we were going to go home and do that. There was no chance at all. So George is doing this thing, and we are just uh, blown away that he's doing it. So he he takes a piece of thread, he bowls it up, he puts it on his tongue, he swallows it down, and then he pulls them from his mouth, uh, all the razor blades linked onto the thread, threaded under the thread. Uh, you know, I, these are things that I saw when I was eight years old, sitting on the floor in some gymnasium, some, uh, some church auditorium is what it was. I think it was a Methodist church uh, way down on Lock Raven Boulevard is where we used to meet. And... Um, uh, boy, what an impression it made. Uh, so, so that was really the first live performance that I ever saw. <coughs> and, and, it, and it stayed with me. And, I, and I, I loved magic from that point on. Of course, of course he, he'd already told me the Blackstone stories. So I was already into it because of that. Uh, but that's not all. That's not all. So a few years later, this was probably 1968, 69, that I saw George perform at the, at the Cub Scout group. So fast forward to 1970 or 1971. Now when you're a child, that's a long period of time. When you're an adult, that's not so long. But uh, to me, it was, it was ages. And so uh, my dad comes home and he's, he's purchased tickets to George Goebel's full evening show. The full evening show. Uh, George, by the way, ran a costume shop downtown Baltimore. And that's what he did full time. He didn't do magic full time, although he, he probably he had he had a great show. Let's you know what you know what, folks. After the Blackstone show ended, which was in sometime in the 1950s, uh, you didn't have, as far as I know, you didn't have touring big shows. I mean, I mean, full theatrical productions that were magic shows. George. George kept that tradition alive. He produced a big show. He had a chorus line. He had an orchestra. He had grand illusions. He had stage settings for the effects. Uh, you know, you're used to seeing this in the David Copperfield show, in the Siegfried and Roy show. Uh, but uh, after the Golden Age, you didn't see a whole lot of it. You know, I think a lot of performers uh, uh, at the end of vaudeville, a lot of performers found work in clubs, and Robert Harbin being one of them, and and you uh, you performed almost in the round, so you had a much different show to do. 
and, and so the, the, the big show, the big stage presentation really was on the decline until, in my opinion, until Doug Henning. And we'll talk about Doug Henning in another video because he, he also was a great influencer on me. But uh, so George, George was producing this huge show and, and uh, my dad got tickets and we went and uh, we weren't sitting that far off the front row. I, maybe, oh gosh, maybe a quarter of the way back, I'm not sure, but that was the night of my life, let me tell you. Uh, you know, and you, you, can, you can actually see George's full show. I think when you buy the book, maybe you might get a DVD, maybe not, I don't know, but I, I think somehow or other I got a hold of it and, um, and I've been able to see it since. But, but I mean, when you're, when you're 10 years old or you're 11 years old and, and you're sitting in a theater and you're watching the George Goebel show, uh, wow, wow, uh, talk about a sense of wonder. And that's what it's all about. You know, it's about creating wonder for your audience. And the wonder that George Goebel created in me endured to this day. It's a tribute to the performing artist that George Goebel was. Uh, he did a number of, of great effects that I remember, but, but the one that stands out the most to me is, is at the time, it was the first time I'd ever seen it. I, I had never seen, <coughs> and this, this is a shame, folks, that I'm, I'm 11 years old, or 10, and I've never seen a full evening show. Uh, now you might think, well, lots of 10-year-olds never see a full evening show, but there was a period in history, and the vaudeville period is what I'm talking about, when the family went to the theater, and the, the family saw live theater. Live theater. I'm not talking about going to the cinema and paying for a ticket and sitting down watching some movie. I'm talking about live performers on a stage. Uh, there's a difference, man. There's a difference. And, and if you haven't seen, it's possible that you're watching this video and you haven't seen live theater. You haven't gone to, the, you haven't seen a play. You haven't seen a magic show. You haven't seen the circus. You haven't seen live theater. Uh, it's, it's not, it's different. It's, it's, it's interactive. It's personal. It's, uh, it's an exchange of communication between the performers and the audience like no other. So, and I just think it's a shame that, that we have generations of people today who don't understand the theatrical experience because they've never had it. So, uh, but, but I love theater and I, and I love magic and, and so to be able to see George Goebel on stage was an amazing thing. <coughs> so the one, the one, <coughs> the one standout for me was what is known today as the Ajra Levitation. But remember, I, I have never seen anything before. I've, this, is, this is my first experience. Um, for many of you who are magic, have been in magic a long time, this is an effect that is, you know, pretty common. But it, 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 was, it was new for me. So here's what happens. And this, this, this woman comes out in this, this gown, the beautiful gown. She lays down on the sofa. George Goebel and an assistant covers her with a cloth and then, and then her silhouette obviously begins to rise up out of the sofa. She's floating up and then, and then somebody moves the sofa off stage and she continues to rise up, up, up. So she, now she's, she's above George Goebel's head, she's floating toward the ceiling and he reaches up and let, let me just tell you what the effect is. Now, there's a difference between what actually happens and the effect on the audience. That's an important point. So he reaches up, he grabs the cloth that's covering this woman. You can see her silhouette, her body underneath this cover. And he pulls it. And as it comes down, she vanishes. She vanishes in midair. That's the effect, folks. That's what the audience sees. The body vanishes out of thin air and then she comes she screams she's at the back of the theater she screams everybody turns around they're shocked and she comes running down the center aisle back to the stage wow 
I was just uh, that that's magic folks that's that's what it's all about you know it's it's about the experience of wonder and it wasn't about fooling anybody it wasn't about uh, pulling the wool over anyone's eyes It's not about the seats not about any of that it's about wonder so I was in awe and I remember <sighs> Now, George was selling uh, a book. It was I, I, at the time. Again, I don't I don't have a lot of experience. I have any experience, but he's selling that book. It's basically an easy magic, uh, Robin's book on on basic tricks. And I'm thinking, I'm gonna, Dad, please, 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 right? So he he buys me this book, and I take it home. And I've already already had a, a magic kit. I've already been doing magic. I've already uh, done a show for my show and tell group. At eight years old, and I was I was heckled and. Uh, one of the kids in the class knew the tricks, and <clears throat> so I've already had that experience. Uh, but now I've got this new book, and just like today, folks, I mean, it's the same. I, I, I haven't changed a whole lot. Uh, I, I get a magic book, I bring it home, I read that thing from cover to cover, I write notes, I highlight, I, I uh, do all sorts of stuff. And there wasn't a whole lot of material in that book that I could use, but. Uh, but nevertheless, it was it was a treasure to me at the time. Now, years later, years later, I, I am performing. I'm out working, and uh, I'm doing my own show. I'm, I'm not certainly not doing the Goebel show or anything like it. I certainly had aspirations. That's another story. I had an assistant by the name of Jill. At the time, her name was Jill Kennard. And we worked together for 11 years on an illusion show. And uh, the thing about illusion shows, you're, you're either a good carpenter or you're not, and if you're not a good carpenter, you're you're buying illusions, and these things are expensive, so uh, it, it's hard to recoup when you're not doing big money shows. And I wasn't, I wasn't, so uh, it's hard to recoup that investment, and it was difficult, and so it was an expensive show. But I did, I did an illusion show for 11 years with my partner Jill, um, and it was during that time that I just got the idea. I got the idea. You know, George is local. Why not call him up and see? So I called him up. And I said, you know, you don't know me, but you've had a profound influence on my life. Uh, I saw you as a Cub Scout. I saw you later doing your full illusion show. And, and George said, come on down. I'd love to meet you. He rolled out the red carpet. And I journeyed to his house. I don't know how many times. I spent many, many evenings with George uh, he was retired at the time, retired from performing at, in, at any rate. Um, and he would regale me with story after story after story and something I did not know. Now, now my hope was to spend time with George and to get to know him as a person. Not as the performer, not as the stage persona, but to get to know him as a human being. And I found him, by the way, warm, kind, generous, if I could, if I could put up someone and say, "Here's a model human being," it would be George Goebel. He was just, just a wonderful, wonderful human being. Uh, not only because he he was so hospitable to me, but just his kindness, his 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 demeanor. He he was just a a, a fantastic human being that that I love to be around. Um, so I, I would visit him many, many evenings and spend a lot of time with him. And, and uh, what I did not know when I began to visit him was that he, he had such a, such a collection. I mean, this collection, I believe it caught the attention of David Copperfield. Um, but, but he knew, we, we would talk about old shows, we would talk about the great shows.